Mr. Kok Heng Lun. Deputy Speaker, thank you for the opportunity to speak on this bill. Uh, when IMDA seeks a consultation last year with the film community, uh, I think I must first thank IMDA for going all out in that concerted effort, even before the amendment uh, was being put out, and uh, even extending the consultation uh, deadline, and I think that was very helpful. And with that, actually, uh, during the consultation, the film community actually put up a position paper whereby 48 uh, filmmakers and part of them well-known filmmakers have actually raised their concerns. And so in my speech, I will actually address some of these concerns that were put up by the filmmakers, which also was actually addressed by my colleague just now, Mr. Zaki. So some words seem repetitive, so do bear with me. Uh, so I will highlight three main, three main areas of concern. The first area of concerns pertain to whether several amendments here may restrict the uh, creative boundaries and artistic space for the filmmakers. The second area is about the sweeping powers given to IMDA uh, enforcement officers, and the third would pertain to the need to ensure due process and fairness in relation to the appeal process under the Film Act. Now let's look at the first area of concern. There are several amendments to this bill that I feel might potentially stifle the space for creativity and the artistic work by filmmakers. Under the proposed section 16, a firm that is amongst others, I quote, against national security, unquote, or that, I quote, contains any materials prescribed, unquote, will be refused classification. I know that there is no specification of what is the definition of material prescribed, nor is there a definition of what is against national security. Having spoken to some filmmakers, they have expressed concern that the lack of clarity of the above terms may have unintended effect of restricting and impeding how to produce their films, since they do not know whether the content of their films may have crossed boundaries such that it becomes against national security, and therefore refuse classification. In turn, this may cause the film industry to self-censor itself on the kind of films that they may produce. I therefore hope that the uh, minister can provide some clarifications or guidelines as to what constitutes a film that contains material prescribed or one that is against national security. On the definition of national security, I, I note that it is not impossible to provide some clarity on its contour. Take, for example, the public order and special power bills that we just debated just now. The bill has specifically set out several situations that constitute serious incidents that may affect public order and security. Further, under the proposed section 15.5, the provision sets out several gu guidelines as to what will be taken into consideration in classifying a firm. Although section 15.5 does not strictly relate to issues of national security or prescribed material, it does show that it is possible, at the very least, to provide examples of what would be taken account in reaching a particular classification decision. Even if it is not possible to give a clear definition of what constitutes prescribed materials or what is against national security, at the very least, the minister can set out what it would take into consideration in determining whether a firm is against national security or contains those prescribed materials. Such clarity is important to ensure a creative environment in which the film industry will not be inhibited by unknown legal parameters and to cultivate an environment that encourages diverse narratives and perspectives to, the, to, to be explored through the film. And I agree with the Minister that actually films are, talks about what we are and who we are and are important cultural tenets of this society. On a related note, as regards to the proposed section 16 which permits the minister to refuse classification, I would like to clarify whether this means that the minister would refuse classification of a firm that falls under the proposed section 16, or does it mean that such a firm will be given a refused classification rating? Again, I think uh, the way we put the uh, terminology becomes very important so that it will not cause confusion. Uh, Mr. Speaker, Deputy Speaker, I'm also concerned about the introduction of the crow classification scheme. This convenience has been uh, welcomed by the businesses, most 
by the distributors as it shortens the processing time when they can classify their own PG or PG-13 firms instead of waiting for on the uh, IMDA classification division. However, the firm community is not just made out of these distributors. In fact, the scheme may not benefit filmmakers or consumers. As it is now in Singapore, some production companies are also distributors. And one of them have just brought over even a cinema chain. So a three-in-one production company, distributors, and exhibitor. With so many interests at stake, it could be the case whereby interventions can happen even at the creative process, as early as scripting stage, editing stage to cut out more in order to feed lower age restriction ratings. And in this ecosystem, the filmmakers may find themselves in a disadvantageous position with lesser bargaining power and have to compromise their artistic vision. Creators should be allowed to make works that can best express their stories and engage consumers and leave the regulatory and censorship monitoring to the authorities and be allowed to appeal if they think an age restriction rating is too strict. But as we can see in several cases, the consumers are not well served by this amendment and can in fact be shortchanged by this. This is because distributors are, disincentiv are incentivized to cut out shorts to achieve a lower age restriction rating and hence reach possibly larger audiences. But consumers may not be fully informed on what they are missing, even when they are still paying for a full price admission. The fact that the firm has been censored is usually not advertised on the promotional collaterals put up by the distributors and cinema operators. So a rating that is displayed at the box office where consumers buy their tickets would usually be stated simply just as PG-13 when in fact certain scenes may have been taken away. So instead, maybe it should be accurately reflected as PG-13 bracket edited. At the same time, external content assessors will be penalised if they classify it wrongly. Hence, it will inevitably lead to them being more conservative in the way they classify. I want to now turn to the proposed section 34 and 34A of the bill which confers the IMDA enforcement officer with intrusive and excessive powers. Under the proposed section 34 that is read with section 34A, enforcement officers are given overarching powers such as being permitted to enter a place using such force as is reasonably necessary to en obtain entry, or to seize any film, advertisement, or equipment that may be evidential material without warrant if the enforcement officers reasonably suspect that certain offences have been committed. Fundamentally, I believe that such sweeping and intrusive power should only be granted to the police who are the custodian of law and order. Moreover, I'm concerned whether we are giving too much power to enforcement officers who, as compared to our police, might not have the operational experience and expertise to effectively discharge such powers. I further note that under proposed section 34, 11, and of, and, and, an enforcement officer may be assisted by other individuals in exercising enforcement powers under this Act. It is not clear from this section who such other individuals refer to, nor are such other individuals defined under the Bill. Can the Minister clarify who these other individuals refer to? Do such other individuals refer to IMDA licensing officer and or classification officer, or are they non-IMDA officers? What are the situations which the minister would envisage the assistance of such other individuals? And can the minister clarify what are the powers which such individuals can exercise while assisting an enforcement officer in discharging their duties under the Act? Apart from the fact that the enforcement and police officers are exercising sweeping powers, I'm concerned that such powers may be exercised without a warrant under Section 34A2 if such officers suspect that certain office offences under the Act are committed. I note that under Criminal Procedure Code, a police may exercise its power, search and seizure only when an arrestable offence is committed. Some examples of an arrestable Offence under our penal code includes rioting or involuntarily causing grievous hurt. I note that the offences under Film Acts are actually nowhere as severe or violent as the examples of arrestable offences which I have just cited. Moreover, there is nothing in the Film Act 
or in the amendment to this bill, which provides that the offences under the Act are arrestable. I would like, therefore, to understand why, despite the fact that the offences under the Act are non-arrestable, and despite the fact that these offences are not as severe as arrestable offences, then why enforcement officers and police are permitted to search and seize without warrant? Moreover, what I feel is particularly egregious is the fact that an enforcement officer may exercise such intrusive power without warrant, powers that are traditionally within the purview of the police. In addition, I would like to understand what prompted the government to provide for such a devolution of powers from the police to enforcement officer and to potentially other undefined individuals. In this bill, the expanding search and seize power allows for IMDA enforcement officers to break into any venue to collect any evidential materials as well as not evidential materials that they happen to take. We must be reminded that what they can seize now are not just DVDs or film reels, but would also include personal digital devices, including mobile phones, personal tablets, laptops, computers, and any type of storage devices, including the thumb drives, which will now be materials that can be seized for prosecution. How do we ensure that the enforcement officer will not be overzealous in their search for evidence, such as privacy of individuals are not infringed? I next turn to the next area of concern, which is to ensure due process and fairness in the appeal process. I'm rather concerned that neither the firm acts nor the amendment provides that the appellant appealing a decision is guaranteed the right to be heard by either the committee of appeal or the minister. With regard to appealing a decision, a decision which is to be heard by a minister, the proposed 24A treaty merely states that the minister may consult any person before making his decision regarding the appeal. With regard to the appeal to be heard by the committee of appeal under the proposed section 24, the said section did not provide that the applicant has the right to be heard by the committee. Mr. Speaker, as a matter of ensuring due process and fairness, it is important that such an applicant has the right to be heard by the relevant appellant body so that such an applicant has the opportunity to make his or her case personally. And in, as I understand it, the current practice is that the firm appeal committee does give an aggrieved individual who is appealing a decision of IMDA the right to be heard. However, unless the right to be heard is legislated under the firm act, there's simply no guarantee such a practice will continue. Another concern that I have with the appeal process is with the compositions of the uh, firm's appeal committee. Clause 12 of the bill, which provides for the constitution of the, of the committee of appeal, only provides that the number of the members is of at least 15, but not more than 21 members. Mr. Speaker, uh, Deputy Speaker, in a submission made by a group of filmmakers during a public consultation, they have recommended, recommended that the Committee of Appeal be made up of more individuals from the firm industry to be appointed to the committee. Presently, only one out of 15 members of the committee is from the firm industry. I also note that the present committee comprises of a few civil servants, school principals, professors, as well as lawyers. However, given that the Committee of Appeal will be dealing with appeal matter concerning appeals from filmmakers. I feel that having more members from the film industry will be beneficial to the committee. In terms of the relevant experience and expertise that members of this film industry can contribute. To quote from one of the filmmakers in one of the discussions that I have with her, we in the film community do have valuable professional perspectives to contribute, as well as feedback rooted in civic and consumer rights. I understand the appointment of the present committee will end by two, June 2019. I hope to understand from the minister whether he will take into consideration to have a more diverse selection of members of committee, including those from the film industry when appointing the next committee. I have one more clarification that I hope the minister can address. I hope that the proposed section 24 and 24A of the bill, I note that the proposed section 24 and 24A of the bill is silent as to whether the applicant making the appeal will be provided the grounds of decisions made by either the applicant, either by the committee of, uh, of appeal or the minister. As a matter of ensuring due process and in fairness to the applicant, he or she should be aware of the basis on which his or her appeal is either upheld or dismissed. 
Further, providing the grounds of decisions also ensures that you know, the decision maker is held accountable. Finally, Mr. Speaker, I will turn to the last area of concerning, concern pertaining to the continued criminal, continue criminal, criminalization of the making and reproduction of party political firms under Section 33 of the Firm Act. I know this has been not put up for amendment in this particular bill. However, it is stated clearly in the explanatory statement that one of the purpose of this present amendment to the Firm Act is for excluding private ex exhibition and the making and the reproduction of films. In paragraph 2.15 of the IMDA public consultation paper, it is stated that, I quote, MCI IMDA would like to clarify that the primary regulatory focus of the Film X remain on the distribution and public exhibition of films, as these activities have wider and more direct impact on consumers, which just now uh, the minister had really reiterated that. Moreover, under the proposed Section 2.6, it is expressly stated that the private viewing alone of a firm by an individual does not constitute exhibiting the firm by the individual. It is clear from the book that private viewing on the of a firm is not thought to be criminalised. However, if a person makes a party political firm for the sole purpose of viewing it by him or herself without any intention of publishing or distributing such a firm, would such a person be criminally liable? To put it in context, take for example, an individual who video records a political rally. The person then edits the video with a video editing app by ending in some music and politically motivated slogans for his own personal viewing, or just to share this edited video privately with some of his friends. If I'm not mistaken, such a video may fall under the definition of the firm provided under the section uh, proposed Section 3 of the Bill and may constitute a party political firm under the present Section 2 of the Firm Act. It seems disproportionate that such an individual may be criminally liable for the making of such a video under Section 33B of the present Firm Act. I therefore hope the Minister can consider also amending Section 33B of the present Firm Act to address the disparity in the standards where the making and reproduction of party political firms are criminalised, but the making and reproduction of non-political firms are not criminalised under the new amendments. That said, I again would like to thank the Ministry for being, relatively, for being very responsive throughout the public consultation period and for taking seriously consideration of the feedback it received, and also have to reconsider and amend certain parts of the amendment bills in light of the feedback it received. But now, with regards to my own uh, fundamental position on one of the important amendment to this bill, which is about the uh, co-classification. In 2014, IMDA actually wanted to propose a similar scheme to the arts sector. The term licensing scheme was proposed for arts group to be able to have their own content assessors to help close classify productions. This was rejected by the co arts community and myself being one of them. One of the fundamental issues I have with this co-classification scheme is this, that the censorship and the regulation guidelines are set up by the authority. And hence, it should be the job of the authority to mend the gates, but for artists to submit it so that the authorities decide how to, whether they want, they, they will classify it or, or not classify it. Why should I, the maker of artistic work, be the one doing regulatory monitoring and censorship for I am DA. Mr. Kong, you have one and a half more minutes. So in light of those concerns, I am at the moment not really sure if I can support this particular act from my own position in that. Because I think there's the difference between classification and censorship. And in this case, I would not say that there is no censorship. There's classification, but censorship do prevails, and that's something that I, as an art maker, fundamentally feel that there is a problem in it. Thank you very much.